All right, everybody, it's the Jerry Metcalf podcast where real estate agents tell how they do it. And today on the show is Laura Peary with the Steel Group of Sotheby's, or the Steel Group Sotheby's International Realty. Again, I think I said in Richmond, Virginia. Thanks for coming on. Good to see you. Good to see you, Jerry. Thanks for having me. So everybody, we met virtually so far through Jeff Wilson, who's been on the show a couple of times, and I'm so excited to have you and learn more. Y'all, she's, you've got a really, a few great lessons and great story. So thank you. I do. Yeah, Jeff's a good buddy. So tell us a little bit. Let's start with where you are now. I know you're a top agent at the Steel Group in Richmond, Virginia, and a top, and a top agent in Virginia. You've got many beautiful properties, including the one here behind me. FYI, I'm sure y'all can tell. Um, but tell us just a little bit about, like, about your career today. So I've, I'm in uh, my eighth year as a realtor. So I've reinvented myself uh, several times um, in my life. Um, but I got into real estate thinking it was just going to kind of be a part-time gig, nothing that I was really very interested in. And, um, like I was telling you earlier, before we got on, I, um, basically got married early, was a stay at home mom, um, had kids and, um, came from a, a background where I really never had to be financially responsible for myself or, you know, really worry that much. Um, did, was a therapist for a while, which satisfied that need to sort of save the world, you know, but in the trenches, yeah. making no money at all, but, you know, still making a difference every day. Yeah. And, um, and we can talk about that more later, how that translates big time into uh, real estate. Yeah. And then, um, got divorced and um, found myself in my late forties, just having to figure out how to financially take care of things and myself and look for my future. Um, again, my mother had been in real estate in the eighties, always had wanted me to, to do the same. And I sort of begrudgingly did it thinking again, it would be part-time, um, never knowing that I would fall passionately, you know, madly in love with it and achieve the type of success that I've been able to achieve in the, in the last eight years. So, um, you know, that, that's where I am now. And, um, there are a couple of blips along the way that has, um, caused me to sort of adjust my yeah. sales a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. So let so first of all, a few things are your former. So you were, well, let's do a review. So you've got kids, two kids, right? Three kids, three kids. No. And how old are they? They're 28, 30 and 32. Wow. Mine are so much younger. And in my head, they're not going to get that big, but they are. <laughs> So, and then about eight years ago, you got into real estate um, because you got divorced and you were like, oh, wait, now it's time to step up and continue to have a life, which means build a career, mm -hmm. um, which I know a lot of people, especially women are like, that's not possible. And it was, you're doing incredibly well. And through that, your former career was basically a psychologist or a counselor psychologist, and also dealing with an dealing with things in the long run, you dealt with some, with some, you've dealt with some serious challenges that have come out. You've turned them into gifts. You've turned curses into blessings. So let's start with everybody. You've got to stay on to hear the whole thing too, because there's so much to this. I don't want to give away too soon. And I want to start there with, take us back to, you got your license, you got your, you, you, you knew you were going to have to figure something out, but how did this all evolve? Like, how did you end up knowing this was it? Because you thought in the beginning it was short term or part time. Or... Well, I just, again, I, I just really wasn't thinking I would do much of it. I was just kind of going to do a little bit, sell a couple people, no, family members homes. Um, and um, I ended up writing a letter, somebody, a family friend's parent had passed away and I ended up writing a letter to one of the sons. Um, and I, I'm a real proponent of letter writing, by the way, you know, I don't do postcards. I write letters, um, oh, because yeah. I think they're effective. Um, so yeah. I just wrote this letter. Um, anyway, I was brand spanking new in real estate. Um, and he responded back and, and anyway, I ended up getting a seat at the table to have a listing presentation for a $2 million listing, which was my first listing in Richmond. And that's a pretty high price point here. Um, yeah. and I remember going to my broker, Bill Steele at the time 
And I said, you know, Bill, I really, um, I'm excited because I think I've got a, a great lead for our first listing of mine. And it's going to be, um, it's the $2 million listing. And, you know, he, his eyes got really wide and his mouth dropped. And he, he was like, you know, how are you going to handle that? Because he knew that I really didn't know what I was doing. Right. Yeah. Um, and I said, well, oh, don't worry. I'll, I'll ask Bo, his son, who was the associate broker. I said, I'll ask him to co-list it with me. And he was just immediately just like relieved because, you know, he, he knew I would need that kind of help. Um, and, and what I found was, you know, I've never been afraid to ask for somebody to help me, especially if they know how to do it better than I do. Yeah. So, you know, from the get go, I've never been uh, afraid to share or worried or, you know, I don't get the calculator out uh, and figure out how much I'm going to make on the front end. I always am focused on the relationship, getting the, the job done, um, servicing people's to my best of my ability and the, you know, the accolades and the financial piece always follows that. And I'm, you know, I was a therapist making maybe $35,000 a year, um, a year. And now that can easily like happen a year. One, right. one transaction. So, you know, I think for a lot of people who, who, especially women who feel like they're glass ceilings or you really can't reinvent yourself, please believe in yourself because you can, you just have to work hard. I love that. Work hard and find find what you're good at, right? And how did you know? So you kind of you kind of went at this, you went after $2 million listing. And is that when you got the bug and said, okay, wait a minute, I am going to do this or what happened? Yeah. I mean, that was a great first listing. I learned a lot because um, I had no idea what I was doing. But um, And then I was able to get a foothold in a, a secondary market um, down in the northern neck of Virginia. So it's, it's like the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay. It's kind of a feeder market for second homes in Richmond and a little bit remote from where I live, but I was willing to go the distance, um, you know, to get some traction and some footage and then bring that experience and that portfolio back into the primary market to be able to have credibility. So that's kind of what I started doing. And that was fortunate because in that part of uh, Virginia, there weren't that many, well, there weren't any Sotheby's agents and not, there were more, you know, local agents. And a lot of the people who own second homes, there really valued um, the reputation of Sotheby's international yeah. reality. And also just wanted somebody kind of outside of the small town to represent them. So I was fortunate, right place, right time um, with that. that no, but, so did that give you, that gave you a portfolio of bigger listings so you went and found where there's less competition where you were doing something nobody else was doing yes you got traction in that market now were those people come those people were also coming into richmond yes okay so you were picking up buyers and sellers mm -hmm. what? I, I, for the first what did you say i love that like that's brilliant yeah i mean you know it wasn't that at that point there was really not much strategy to it it was just kind of you know that's i was willing to drive an hour, hour and a half, even two hours to, to grab a listing. Now I, I only do waterfront down there. There are other yeah. homes that are not waterfront, but, and it became a niche market. And now I'm known in my office as the river queen. And I get referrals from all over the country because a lot of people have, you know, second and third homes. And I mean, especially after the pandemic, right? Everybody wants waterfront yeah. lifestyle. And, so look, at, like, look at how that all that unfolded too. It was like a way to like get yourself in the market where it worked. And you never know what the future holds. Like who knew? There's exactly. such a demand for that product and luxury in general now as well. So how quickly did you get traction and did you become kind of a quote top agent as you got going? Um, well, that first year, you know, I had that listing um, that I was talking about, but in the middle of trying, that took about a year to, to get to market because it was um, an estate situation. We had to get the house you know, you know how that takes just the two yeah. months and months. But, but during that time, I um, had an injury. Um, I was coming up from swimming um, at my club and I was walking across the drive at the, in the parking lot and got struck by a car um, and had a head injury. So you were walking and got hit by a car. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so, I had a head injury. This is on April Fool's Day, 2015. Holidays. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you can't write this stuff, right? Yeah. 
So had the head injury, um, had, um, you know, I'm fortunate because I didn't have any other physical injuries, but um, had have a mild TBI that I still have, um, which compromises sort of my short-term memory. And yeah, some of the, when I get overly task, multitasking thing, it just, it's just some internal brain stuff that you really don't necessarily see, but, um, I have to navigate it all the time. So what that forced me to do, cause I just well, wait, pause for a minute. So you TBI, what does TBI stand for? Traumatic brain injury. Okay. So <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> see for everybody, everybody's like, you didn't know that anyway. So you were going into, you, you had a traumatic brain injury, short-term memory loss or things that still affect you and what you did to compensate or actually compensates a bad word because you really made a gift of, you made a gift of a curse. Right. I mean, one of the things that I, um, I know about myself and that I'm really resilient and I can always reframe a situation and make it, you know, a, a positive experience. Um, and that's all about like, you know, I told you, I said it earlier, I really believe thoughts become things and you have to really make sure you choose those correct, you know, wisely. So I had this, um, so what I ended up doing, I have, um, I'm very fortunate. Also, I know a lot of colleagues in the Sotheby's, um, you know, across the country and um, we were all being coached by the same person. And this one gal had really strong processes. Um, you might know Mackenzie Casey. Yeah. Another yeah. international reality. So she's, she's, she was very generous and shared a lot of um, kind of my foundational processes. But what ended up happening was I spent uh, a whole year getting my processes totally down to like the, the nano movement of what you have to do for a certain listing or a buyer or whatever. And it, it was because I was forgetting things. And so yeah. I did it because I had to, and any great guru or coach or ninja or whatever will say, you know, get your processes in place and, and get your business um, aligned like that. You know, it's, it's not necessarily about your goals. It's about the, your processes. Um, and so I was kind of forced into that organically yeah. because of my brain injury. And I think because I did that so well and so strongly and so like almost desperately, I was able, I, I did it and didn't like a lot of people kind of push back and say they don't have time to do it or whatever, but I had to. So, so ever since I've had those really strongly in place, which has probably been, I don't know, two, three years, I've gotten them all really down pat. Um, you know, things have just been soaring. And, and the other thing is, you know, I delegate a lot of the tasks. Um, so so get, setting up your processes, getting really good at that, and then you just said delegating your tasks. So in setting up your processes, I mean, anybody can write a list, but how do you make sure it's implemented? How do you hold people accountable to it? How many people do you hold accountable to it? Really, I'm, how do you implement it? Let's so the list is, I mean, the processes, like you said, are a list. And by the way, if anybody wants to contact me, I'm happy to share those with them. Um, I, I, you know, I love sharing. Um, yeah. So um, hey, share them with me. I, I mean, I've got some, but I, I'm always, I'm always up for refining them. Well, I put them on, um, for me, I mean, it's super easy. Uh, I put them on a Trello board. So each, yeah. each client has a Trello board, which is a free, you know, app. Um, yeah. And so whether it's a buyer or a seller, we just upload the processes. So I've got an initial buyer process, a buyer representation. You process, have a list and you practice. assign it to your assistant on what to do. And if she checks it off or he checks it off when it's done, yep. and you have one assistant, two assistants. I have one assistant and I have a um, one lead assisting agent. So like a lead generator or, um, or services leads once they come in. Yeah. Or just services uh, leads that are under a certain price point usually. Gotcha. So Trello, that, is that like a sauna or is that like a checklist where you, I use a sauna, that's what I'm asking. Like, oh, oh, oh. Um, yeah. Is it an app, a program? Yeah, it's just a free program. And again, that we're getting, that's not, in, I don't say in that lane, I, Janie does that I love for me. This so. stuff, right? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna but check it's like, it's like a board, you know, it's kind of like yeah. a, you, you upload things. And, and so I can see when things are checked off and, you know, part of her, 
um, daily accountability is every morning and every afternoon before she leaves, she has to update, make sure that cello board's updated. Updated every day and every afternoon. That's yeah. awesome. So, wow. And how many listings do you guys carry at a time usually? Um, it's, I mean, right now there, I have. Right now, everybody has none. Yeah, I mean, I have two, I have two coming up. So I have one, you know, typically, I don't know, three to 10. That's I mean, good. it's not yeah. that many. Just to get an idea of how, but it's amazing how, like your spot, you have a lot of historic properties. It's amazing how something that's not different, very similar, two hundred three thousand dollar. I mean, whatever, making up a price point, but kind of an average price point of a metropolitan area that pushes through quickly. Then you start getting these bigger, bigger, more elaborate properties, and the things that have to be done are different for every property and more intricate. And it's like doing ten listings, you know, for one typical listing. So it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, I really think the amount of stuff is about the same whether or not it's yeah. 300,000 or 3 million. It's just a yeah. little bit, you gotta be perhaps a little bit more savvy uh, with some of your strategies for the higher end listing that might take longer or, you know, I, I, I my listing presentation is, is pretty much the same with the exception of some of the additional things I might do for a higher end listing, um, but, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I've got a lot more buyers because of the pandemic. So, you know, as does everybody, but exactly. you know, I just, I, I love what I do. And I just, I believe that there's abundance everywhere. I don't worry about, you know, I, I, from the very beginning, I've always just looked around any neighborhood and there's so many houses, there's, there's so much for everybody. And so that's always been my mindset. And I think that's a big piece of why I'm successful. Yeah, is, exactly. Is that I, I maintain that and I show up. It gives you a little bit of peace too. So well, there's only so much and I have to get it because there's not enough. Well, scarcity does not work in any type of relationship, does it? No, not really. <laughs> exactly. It's a well. De I always say never be desperate, never be defensive because neither one of those goes well. And a mindset scarcity or scarcity of mindset always pushes both of those. So what have you... Like as you came into business, you talked about like you took a year to get this one listing ready. Is that what your whole year was? And you talked about lessons you learned with that listing. Mm -hmm. um, what did that look like? What were the lessons? Uh, well, that year was the year I got hit by the car. So that yeah. required a lot of doctor's appointments for a yeah. long, long time. But in terms of, um, well, I've always had a lot of patience, but I've learned that patience is definitely something that you have to keep in check here. Um, you know, there are a lot of frustrations and a lot of things that can go wrong along the way. And I always um, am aware that I don't need to follow down the path of you know, drama and anxiety and all that. And so I, I, I think one of my superpowers is that I can respond rather than react. And I think I'm pretty good at keeping the ship calm when they're you know rough waters well i love what you said you said this before we started recording but you before respond not react you said when things get negative i just don't go with it or how did you put that it was so look i love the way you, i wish we'd been recording i know well i just don't i mean i don't go in negative spaces if at all possible i delete toxic relationships you know often <laughs> so tell yeah, us I, a, I delete toxic relationships. we have way too much in common I know, I I know I relationships do. often I'm big on that and not I don't write people off I don't write people off easily it's like the do have you ever seen um Tyler Perry's I, everybody I've never talked about this on the show but I maybe I don't think I have but I talk about it all the time Tyler Perry's let him go no I haven't seen it oh I'm gonna send it to you everybody I'm gonna share it but he talks about people and the people in your life and some people anyway the, the, the story is keep the good ones close and let the bad ones go. Hmm. And it's so okay. good. But yeah, back, you tell us a little, because in this business, I find, especially when we're newer, and I'm very guilty of this as a new, as when I was a newer agent is you were trying so hard to just get the client and make it happen that you just put up with whatever you have to. And it's just like literally can suck the life out of you. Mm -hmm. 
what's your experience with that? And I, I mean, no, because now today I have so many amazing clients, but I had a stage in my career where there was a lot of toxicity. What did you have that? Did you not like give us a little bit about because I love what you, to elaborate on what you did say about cut, I cut the toxic relationships out. Yeah. Well, you know, I think every again with my business and and hopefully with my life as well, any sort of challenging situation, I try to find the silver lining or the, you know, the 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 lesson from that. I mean, I've had you know, my most difficult clients have given me the opportunity to create the best systems, really. I mean, I had a very, very, very difficult seller. And, um, you know, because of their difficult demands, I was able to really sharpen my axe and create a really great um, part of my um, listing system, you know, to keep track of things anyway it's, it's yeah. no great shakes but 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 I didn't have that in the past right and yeah. so you know um but and I think through the years with I'm a little bit of a magnet to difficult people I think but um I've learned to really have good boundaries and I think I've really learned how to kind of some people joke that I <laughs> That the, my voice tone changes when I really am serious about what a seller needs to do. Yeah. You know, oftentimes they'll say, well, you know, I knew I had to do it because you had that other Laura voice. And so, um, you know, I think, I think because oh, I'm very, um, uh, I'm very uh, transparent and I'm very upright and authentic you know, and I think a lot of successful agents have to be that building rapport quickly is quite easy for me. And along with that is trust. And so I believe in people and they believe in me. Yeah, exactly. So back, so, but when it comes to toxic relationships, do you find you, do they come in and you figure out how to cut them out or do you see them coming and make sure they just don't get in? <laughs> I've learned I'm just not a lot of men, but it took me a long time to get there. I think I'm better at seeing them now. Yeah. Um, and I just try to really, I think it's really about boundaries mm -hmm. and it's about not feeding into, um, you know, anybody who's angry really wants you to come to their level and be angry with them. Right. Cause it just feeds them. And so I try not to, there's a fine line. And I think some of my therapy training has helped with that and just life training. Well, let's talk so, a little bit about that because you tell us a little bit, because that will get us into your communicate. You're just a life experience dealing with, because side note from me, I have found that I feel that real estate agents don't truly embrace the power and the necessity of understanding emotions and using that to negotiate well because they go hand in hand. So coming from your background, tell us at first, I know about it, but you give us a little bit about what you did before, post-traumatic stress, veterans, you, will, you keep going from there. So I was working in a behavioral health hospital um, that was sort of garden variety, um, mental health, you know, your typical depression, suicidal ideation, psychotic, whatever. There was a Mm -hmm. children with um, at-risk behavior, et cetera. But they had a military unit that they had built really in response to all of the, um, the OEF and OIF um, veterans who had, you know, just experienced horrific things in the, um, you know, the last war. So um, it was a great, huge need to develop that um, wing. And they, the hospital took sort of the best of the best from all the disciplines and had them be primaries on that unit. So um, I was the um, on that unit exclusively and it was, you know, PTSD and substance abuse. And a lot of times those two go hand in hand. And um, I was in groups when patients would have flashbacks and bang their fists in a cement wall or, I mean, you know, it's pretty significant. Um, and I think just 
you know, my goal was to just help these people come back to a sense of as much normalcy as possible. Um, and I understood what was going on, you know, intellectually, obviously not, not emotionally. Um, and I just love doing it. Um, what did you do in those situations? We're not going to become therapists in five minutes, but what did you apply there? And what can we learn from that? And what did into business now? I think when somebody is in duress or stress, I think you have to just give them some space, uh, let them express whatever that is. Keep yourself safe if it's something like, you know, somebody's taking a swing at you. Um, but that, <laughs> knock on wood, that hasn't happened yet with me in real estate. Um, and I think I'm always trying to, in my head, not, I'm not thinking, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes. So it's having some empathy, yeah. um, trying to understand where they're coming from, understanding that they are clearly upset about something. And hopefully it's something that we, you know, if it's a misunderstanding, we can straighten it out. But I think you just have to get a little space in between the, the heat of the matter. Um, and then just like any good therapy, you got to process it, right? So, yeah. um, and, you know, I think a lot of people maybe lash out because they expect you to run away because maybe that's what happened in their past, you know, to keep people away. Um, and I just don't do that. So, because in our business, they do lash out or clients do do that. Or then agents do that. Oh, yeah. So when they do that, you think they're trying to keep us away or... And I'm, I'm like, not, I like, don't have an opinion. I'm curious. I'm asking the professional here, but really, why do they do that? Well, I think people uh, can be very reactionary and it's yeah. based on things that we might not be seeing right in front of us. I mean, it's about your past history. I mean, you know, we can do a whole nother dive deep on that, but um, everybody responds for different reasons and yeah. everybody has different perspectives, right? Yeah. I remember like when you took, I remember when I took driver's ed, they showed that video of like an accident happening and then like six people around the scene and each person had a different view of what happened. Yeah. I mean, it's basically what happens with any situation. You, you know, you, you have an event that happens and then you have got different perspectives and, you know, representing people's usually one of their biggest assets, if not the biggest asset, you know, it's, it's a stressor. And so you have to make sure that you nurture that and and hold yeah. it as dearly as they hold it and and you know I guess just be I don't know I'm, I keep on going like this it's kind of like it was holding their embrace perspective. them right yeah. but when you until you embrace their perspective they can't trust you. you talked about trust how can they trust you enough to be guided to any other perspective unless you can see theirs first you know, seek first seek mm -hmm. to understand and be understood or if i can't understand your perspective how can i help you if, even if your perspective is wrong if i don't understand it and empathize with it in some way not sympathize but empathize mm -hmm. how can we be sure it's wrong and how can we be sure we know what the right thing to do is for that person when we don't know their perspective right so i think is that kind of like that's what i'm hearing yeah i mean i think again i think we all do the best we can do and it's, it's helpful yeah. if we can make, be aware of enough of ourselves that in a stressful situation that we have a choice of how we want to respond. And that's where we have the control, right? right? We might not be able to control what's going on or the person across from us, but we can control how we choose to respond. And that is always where I begin. Yeah. Um, Do you and, ever have those moments when I go ahead? No, 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 I just was going to say, I think in terms of building trust with my clients, I do a lot of, I think in the very beginning, I, I have lots of conversations about, you know, what they want and what I'm about and how we can navigate this together. And again, I, I feel like just my personality or I don't, I, I feel like I'm just doing what I do, but I've had feedback that I'm able to really connect with people quickly. So you talk about probably because you can empathize and they sense that mm. respond don't react i mean i've had my moments where people are losing it on me and i'm like you know there's some things i want to say right now and they're just not going to work and i actually have like a thing i do now and that happens to it and it brings everybody it diffuses everything 
what is yours? Like, how well, do you do when people, when you're just like, do you ever get it? Cause we're people like we are. Emotional. Oh yeah. Like oh, sometimes I just want to hurt somebody. Oh. And when I get there, I got to do something and it can't be hurt somebody. What's yours? Well, I, I have, I like to diffuse all day long. Yeah. I, like to just I think that's what we all do. Day long, right. Yeah. So that I'm never building up. And so cool. I do something really, I mean, I love it, but I set reminders on my phone of that go off every, it's kind of random and it's just things that are important to me, like sayings that are, you know, important to me. Like right now I've got one that says, uh, take care in the moment, um, never give up. I think the never give up comes like at the end of the day and invariably I'm just like this with somebody and my phone will go do and I look down and it says never give up so um another one I have is attitude attitude is everything which is a big piece of of my philosophy yeah. you know um so those types just of things like little check day, it's like to snap you out point. whatever you yeah. might be in yeah just reinforce the positivity mm -hmm. so we talked yeah. about we talked about, I think we've been talking for half an hour, just not to like, and I don't know everybody, I'm not even what, whatever, it doesn't matter. We talked about daily rituals. I don't want to miss that before we run out of time. Mm -hmm. It's about point. Tell, so you've got, again, I'm going to re, I'm going to repeat your story to everybody. So it, you remember, you came into this business, late 40s, 50. Then your first year in the business, it's hard enough breaking in this business. You have a traumatic brain injury, getting hit by a car of all things. So then you've got to actually, so, but, but all of this stuff could sound so horrible, but you took it all and flipped it. You just kept flipping it. Yeah. You flipped it into a, you, you get divorced. You've got a bad situation. You flip it into a real estate career. Well, you start that and then you get hit by a car and can't remember anything. You flip that into creating processes and making yourself successful. You took every single one of those curses. You took everything that looked like a problem. And a lot of people would say was obstacle and you turn them into opportunities. So now we fast forward, you're very successful. You've got beautiful listings. You're not just, you're a top, top agent. You're a top agent in Sotheby's. You're a top agent in your city. You're a very well-respected person. You've got all of this just groundedness about you and how to handle things. So all of that said, you talked about something. I don't remember if we were recording yet. I don't think we were, but about your daily, you're really big on daily rituals. Right. So <clears throat> I am really, really, um, um, I'm a big believer in daily rituals and routines. Um, I get up every day at 5.30 or 6, uh, kind of do my, what I do. I like to sort of take quiet time to reflect. Then I usually listen or read something inspirational to me. And then I'll um, kind of look at my day and um, kind of get all this stuff done before 8.30 or 9, because at that time I've got to execute you know, people are, the world's coming at me. So yeah. I, you know, and if I don't have time to sort of get myself together before everybody comes at me, then I just am kind of like a gerbil in a wheel all day long. Right. The it's other thing I really, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and the other side note is with that accident, I have an anxiety disorder too. So, you know, so i got to manage all that stuff. Um, but um, so yeah, the, you know, I think the morning routine and ritual, I mean, your body loves the habituation of it. Your mind yeah. does. Um, it's something that I, I can't imagine ever doing anything else. I mean, even when, when we were at working from home and, you know, full on the pandemic, I still kept that routine up. Um, I do a lot of time blocking on my calendar because of my memory problems. I keep everything on a, uh, like on my phone, like a Google drive. This is so funny. Cause you're just like me, but I swear <laughs> I have it in my head because everything's on a Google drive. Everything's in a sauna. Yeah. Everything, every text I send with my team is by yeah. what the topic is. Because if it's, if I don't have it organized by the topic and the deal, I'm like, I can't remember the 20 things we're talking about today. I love it. It's really good. I mean, it's really good for your brain though, too. I mean, imagine there, there's so many agents out there who are doing really well, but I keep on thinking how much better they do if they could get some of these processes down because it gives you my, I mean, I did it because my brain couldn't handle it, 
but it does let your brain not have to worry. Relax. Did I do that? Did I do this? Whatever. Well, the so, constant anxiety when somebody yeah. calls you, when somebody calls me, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to tell them everything we've done. As opposed to, God, what have I forgotten? Exactly. Like the worst. Yeah. So anxiety, we're going to talk, well, we, I'm going to ask you one thing about anxiety and then I'm going to, I want to get into your actual, let me, I'm sorry, y'all. I just have a thousand questions for you and I want to organize them. So number one, your daily ritual, and I'm going to, then I have a question about anxiety. Your daily ritual is every day at 5 30 AM in short, you reflect, reflect five, probably for an hour after you reflect, of course you get ready and you get the big stuff done first. The stuff that's pressing, you make sure you know what's ahead. You make sure things are handled so that by 9 a.m., by then you're showing, showing appointments, phone calls are coming in. Now the day's coming at you and you're ready. Does that cover it? Yeah. Anxiety. So it's interesting how creating all of these things we were just saying actually kind of like settle the anxiety. Mm -hmm. I swear, like we are somehow like aligned by the stars or something because we have so much in common what I'm hearing from you because the same, like I have to do this because of the anxiety. Mm -hmm. What is your, just, you talked about anxiety. You've dealt with people with anxiety. You've dealt with anxiety personally. I actually have two. What have you learned from that? And what do you apply to your life today? And how does that translate into your success? Well, I think again, that morning routine, part of that is because of my injuries um, that I, you know, if you could think of, um, let's just think of metaphor of a trash can, right? And so we we're, we all have a, our trash can. We start the day with an empty trash can and things happen and the trash can's filled. And then normally you just go to sleep and you wake up and the trash can's empty again. That's kind of an easy metaphor. Um, for me, my trash can doesn't ever empty because of my problems, right? So I start the day kind of a quarter full. So what happens is, um, you know, and, and again, moving that metaphor down the road a little bit, like if you have a full trash can and it's not empty, then things kind of start coming out sideways, right? I used to tell yeah. that to my patients as well, right? So you've got to figure out, that's why I do these little seemingly small things, but they're just resets all wow. every day, you know, all day long to help me just like, oh, that's right. And so um, it's just kind of the coping skills that I've developed for myself, but- um, Okay, you know, thriving skills. I yeah. love thriving skills because they've literally sure. like your like your obstacles have turned into opportunities. What you would think you would cope with, you've turned it into a thriving person. Well, I knew I wasn't gonna um I wasn't gonna let this, you know, make me not do anything. I mean, I, I wasn't gonna be have a pity party, you know. I wasn't I wasn't gonna stop doing what I knew I wanted to do. Um again the pity party just, might reinforce all the problems and we don't need that. That's what I always say. I'm like, I don't want a pity party because that's not going to make it better. It could definitely make it worse. Right. So, so you know, I just better. think, again, it's just that, I mean, I really, it goes back to thoughts become things, choose the good ones. Oh. You create what you think. And that's yeah. where you have the control. And that's always been, I've things. always known that that's, huh? Keep going. I just, I didn't want to lose that. Thoughts become things, choose the good ones. And that's the only thing we really have control over, right? Mm -hmm. How we think yeah. about, I mean, so, um, you know, I think um, that's just how I operate, but I, I've done it so much that mm -hmm. it's so routine and it's such a habit. Um, just my mind, the way I think and my thoughts and the, my habit, not just my physical habits, but my mental habits. Yeah. I think mental habits are super important to maintain. It's amazing to listen to you because I've, I, what I see is someone who has taken somebody, and this is what makes a great real estate agent. Give me an obstacle and I will make it an opportunity. Give me something about a house that's supposed to be negative and I will spin it or I will shift the property so that there's a, there, that negative is a positive or there's a positive that way outweighs it and position it that way. So that's what people see in here. And that's what you're doing with your life as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, another oh, thing. Yeah, I negotiation. Go, what were you going to say? Uh, well, uh, just another, I just, I'm thinking like when I'm feeling like I'm stressed out or something, I'm, yeah. I'm always imagining like if you're in a room, I mean, I'm, you know, there's always a window or a door. I'm not trapped, right? <laughs> Metaphorically, right? You know what I mean? So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. 
but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, yeah, I think you just mentioned negotiation. I think for me, that's one of my strengths too, negotiation, because, um, I'm a very fair person. Um, integrity is a big core value of mine. And I understand that in negotiation, you have to, you know, compromise, but, um, I think I'm pretty talented at, at navigating those waters on behalf of my clients. What's the most important thing to keep in mind or never forget when you're negotiating? That both sides most likely want to get the deal done. <laughs> Especially in our business. Yeah. Yeah. That's and a, that's I, and I, I think thing. it doesn't benefit anybody to lose your to lose your temper. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Great um, advice. And also the most important thing during negotiation is breathing. <laughs> yeah, that, there's the Apple Watch. I need to do that lately myself. The other day, I literally <laughs> told you this earlier. I was like, oh my God, I think this is, it was like to the point that I actually laugh at myself because I think, I think I've got a panic attack and that's, maybe that's it. Yeah. Like, I swear there's about to be a panic attack and then I can't have one because it's so funny. It's like ridiculous. <laughs> but anyway, so today looking back at yourself getting into this business and looking at yourself today what do you wish you knew then that you know now um hmm. i well i've always had a lot of confidence i think in myself but i i wish i had stronger confidence in myself earlier yeah um then i then i i mean i, I feel like i i really know what, what the would you say to yourself hmm? what would you say to yourself like if you could go to that person seven or eight years ago what would you say like all right laura yeah you got this laura look at everything you've been through and then i always have my my former patients to you know I have so many stories that are the worst case scenario from people who have been in real trauma and horrible times of their life, you know, the military people yeah. in particular. I always have a story that I can pop in my head that makes me realize what I'm going through is nowhere near that traumatic or stressful or, so it's just it allows me to not go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, you said that when the, when, the, when something goes on the path to negative, when things go down, when I see something going down the path of negativity, I just don't go with it. No, because I have a choice. Love that. All right. Final three. Number one, what has been your most powerful tool in becoming a successful real estate agent? Having very defined processes. And everybody listening is like, well, Jerry, why don't you ask her what they are? Because I know how <laughs> is there anything you want to share about that before you ask the next one other than you are going to share them with us? No, I mean, it's just, I mean, everything we do, we do it so well, you know, when you get used to it, you do it so well and you know how to do it. But wouldn't it be great if all that stuff that's in your head is actually on a piece of paper or somewhere or on a digital file somewhere? And hey, wouldn't it even be greater if you do like me and I know what my hourly rate is? And I delegate everything that's that I can pay somebody to do underneath what my hourly rate is. So speaking of delegating, how do you decide what to delegate? There goes final four. But anyway, final three to final four. How do you decide what to delegate and to whom? Um, well, I delegate. I mean, I, what I OK, what I don't delegate is getting the deal, negotiating and coming in when when things go off the rails. I don't delegate that. So that's a much easier way to do it. I delegate everything, but when you do I'm about, so like my listing, my, let's say, I can't, I haven't counted it recently, but like, let's say my listing process, let's say, yeah, maybe there are 120 some items on that. I am responsible for about 10. <laughs> and those include things, winning the deal, negotiating the deal and fixing problems. Yep. Being the fixer. Cause we're just fixers. Yeah at the end of the day yeah and that talk about some mindset to you gotta have the right my, my husband said things like you know you're just a fixer i'm like yeah i'm a good one too and yeah that's what we're doing i mean so, that's what you know i say i mean that's 
that's why we do it. You know, that's why we get the business we get because we can navigate that and handle it. Um, and, you know, but I don't need to spend time entering an MLS listing, for example, if I've got somebody on my support team that can do it for me, I, I'd rather be out getting more business. That's what I'm good at. Exactly. Next question. <laughs> Books. What is the book that we've got to read that has changed your life or career? Well, a lot of a lot of you probably have read it, but I think it's awesome and it's Atomic Habits by James Clear. I have a copy of it and I haven't read it. Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. And I mean, his one of his quotes is that, you know, you really don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Mm. And, and that's really true. I mean, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I've been able to continue to leverage myself and my brand and my business is because I have everything that I do in a process. Yeah. It, and the other I'm, years to figure that out, unfortunately, but so true. What were you yeah. going to say about just, I mean, I think the other thing is just my, I've figured out early on to surround myself with high functioning, top producing agents, which you I do. Year round. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's how I learned really quickly. I think, you know, just like if you want to learn how to play tennis, you need to play with people who are really good at playing tennis. So that's what I did. And I got to have great relationships with a lot of great people within our brand. And, you know, I've been very fortunate to, um, yeah. to, to be in there. But that um, tennis yeah. analogy is so true. I'm not a tennis player, but when I play with good tennis players, like, I'm like, oh, wait, I can do that. I just have to see it, yeah. be around it. Exactly. I mean, it's powerful. It's, it's very, powerful. very powerful. Yeah. yeah. It's so true. Even I was talking about, and again, everybody knows this is this podcast isn't a Sotheby's commercial. I just happen to be a Sotheby's agent. And I know a lot of great Sotheby's agents and there are other agents at other companies, but I'd say when I came to Sotheby's International Royalty, literally it was like osmosis, like just being around different agents. I found myself doing things differently and doing bigger deals and just doing them better. Nobody even would say what to do. You just take it in that way because that's you don't you don't realize it until it you, it takes you get traction with it. Being it's, around the right people, it's like nothing else. I mean, it's just amazing, just the relationships and the camaraderie and the you know willingness to share. I mean, you you know you got. Yeah. I mean, there's a real tribe. I mean, yeah. it's quite amazing. So true. Last question: If we forget everything else in this interview, what's the one thing we should remember? Um, thoughts become things, choose the good ones. Love it. Laura, thank you. That was so thank much you. fun. Thanks, Jerry. It's great to see you. Thanks for listening to the Jerry Metcalf podcast, where top real estate agents tell how they do it. If you like this episode, please share it with friends. To find more episodes, search Jerry Metcalf podcast on any platform for podcasts or go to jerrymetcalfpodcast.com. That's J-E-R-E-M-E-T-C-A-L-F podcast.com.